the story of Avar Stonesinger. Sit quietly, child, and listen, for the story I tell you is a story of the ages. But what is it, Grandfather? Is it a story of heroes and beasts? The Grandfather looked patiently at the child. He was growing into a fine boy. Soon he would see the value in the stories, the lessons that were taught to each generation. Just listen, child. Let the story take root in your heart. In a time before now, long before now, when the skull were new, there was peace in the land. The sun was hot, and the crops grew long, and the people were happy in the peace that the All-Maker provided. But the skull grew complacent and lazy, and they took for granted the lands and all the gifts the All-Maker had given them. They forgot, or chose not to remember, that the adversary is always watching and that he delights in tormenting the Allmaker and his chosen people. And so it was that the adversary came to be among the Skarl. The adversary has many aspects. He appears in the unholy beasts and the incurable plague. At the end of seasons, we will know him as Thratarg, the world devourer. But in these ages, he came to be known as the greedy man. The greedy man, that is what we call him, for to speak his name would certainly bring ruin on the people, lived among the skull for many months. Perhaps he was once just a man, but when the adversary entered into him, he became the greedy man, and that is how he is remembered. It came to be one day that the powers of the skull left them. The strength left the arms of the warriors, and the shaman could no longer summon the beasts to their side. The elders thought that surely the Allmaker was displeased, and some suggested that the Allmaker had left them forever. It was then that the greedy man appeared to them and spoke. You of the skull have grown fat and lazy. I have stolen the gifts of your Allmaker. I have stolen the oceans, so you will forever know thirst. I have stolen the lands and the trees and the sun, so your crops will wither and die. I have stolen the beasts, so you will go hungry. And I have stolen the winds, so you will live without the spirit of the Allmaker. And until one of you can reclaim these gifts, the Skull will live in misery and despair, for I am the greedy man, and that is my nature." and the greedy man disappeared. The members of the Skarl spoke for many days and nights. They knew that one of them must retrieve the gifts of the Allmaker, but they could not decide who it should be. I cannot go, said the Elder, for I must stay to lead the Skarl and tell our people what is law. Well, I cannot go, said the warrior, for I must protect the Skarl. My sword will be needed in case the greedy man reappears. I cannot go, said the shaman. For the people need my wisdom. I must read the portents and offer my knowledge. It was then that a young man called Avar lifted his voice. He was strong of arm and fleet of foot, though he was not yet a warrior of the Skarl. I will go, said Avar, and the Skarl laughed. Hear me out, the boy continued. I am not yet a warrior, so my sword will not be needed. I cannot read the portents, so the people will not seek my counsel, and I am young and not yet wise in the ways of the law. I will retrieve the gifts of the Allmaker from the greedy man. If I cannot, I will not be missed. The Skull thought on this briefly, and decided to let Avar go. He left the village the next morning to retrieve the gifts. Avar first set out to retrieve the gift of water, so he travelled to the Waterstone. It was there that the Allmaker first spoke to him. Travel west to the sea, and follow the swimmer to the waters of life. So Avar walked to the edge of the ocean, and there was the swimmer, a black hawker, sent from the Allmaker. The swimmer dove into the waters and swam very far and far again. Avar was strong, though, and he swam hard. He followed the swimmer to a cave, swimming deeper and deeper, his lungs burning and limbs exhausted. At last he found a pocket of air, and there in the dark he found the waters of life. Gathering his strength, he took the waters and swam back to the shore. Upon returning to the water stone, the Allmaker spoke. You have returned the gift of water to the Skarl. The oceans again will bear fruit, and their thirst will be quenched. Avar then travelled to the Earthstone, and there the Allmaker spoke to him again. Enter the cave of the hidden music, 
and hear the song of the earth. So Avar travelled north and east to the cave of hidden music. He found himself in a large cavern where the rocks hung from the ceiling and grew from the ground itself. He listened there and heard the song of the earth, but it was faint. Grabbing up his mace, he struck the rocks of the floor in time with the song, and the song grew louder until it filled the cavern and his heart. Then he returned to the earth stone. The gift of the earth is with the skull again, said the Allmaker. The lands are rich again and will bear life. Avar was tired. As the sun burned him, the trees offered no shade and there was no wind to cool him. Still, he travelled on to the beast rock and the Allmaker spoke. Find the good beast and ease his suffering. Avar travelled through the woods of Insafir for many hours until he heard the cries of a bear from over a hill. As he crested a hill, he saw the bear, a falmer's arrow piercing its neck. He checked the woods for falmer, for that is what they were, though some say they are not, and finding none, approached the beast. He spoke soothing words and came upon it slowly, saying, Good beast, I mean you no harm. The Allmaker has sent me to ease your suffering. Hearing these words, the bear ceased his struggles and laid his head at Avar's feet. Avar grasped the arrow and pulled it from the bear's neck. Using the little nature magic he knew, Avar tended the wound, though it took the last bit of his strength. As the bear's wound closed, Avar slept. When he awoke, the bear stood over him, and the remains of a number of the farmer were strewn about. He knew that the good beast had protected him during the night. He travelled back to Beast Rock, the bear by his side, and the Allmaker spoke to him again. You have returned the gift of the beasts. Once again, the good beasts will feed the scar when they are hungry, clothe them when they are cold, and protect them in times of need. Avar's strength had returned, so he travelled on to the tree stone, though the good beast did not follow him. When he arrived, the All-Father spoke to him. The first trees are gone and must be replanted. Find the seed and plant the first tree. Avar travelled again through Herstang Forest, searching for the seeds of the first tree, but he could find none. Then he spoke to the tree spirits, the living trees. They told him that the seeds had been stolen by one of the Falmor, for they are servants of the adversary. And this farmer was hiding them deep in the forest, so that none would ever find them. Avar travelled to the deepest part of the forest, and there he found the evil farmer, surrounded by the lesser tree spirits. Avar could see that the spirits were in his thrall, that he had used his magic of the seeds and spoken their secret name. Avar knew that he could not stand against such a force, and that he must retrieve the seeds in secret. Avar reached into his pouch and drew out his flint. Gathering leaves, he started a small fire outside the clearing where the Falmer and the ensorcelled spirits milled. All the Skarl knew the spirits' hatred of fire, for the fires ravaged the trees they serve. At once, the nature of the spirits took hold and they rushed to quell the flames. During the commotion, Avar snuck behind the Falmer and snatched the pouch of seeds stealing away before the evil being knew they were gone. When Avar returned to the tree stone, he planted the tree in the ground, and the Allmaker spoke to him. The gift of trees is restored. Once again the trees and plants will bloom and grow and provide nourishment and shade. Avar was tired, for the sun would only burn, and the winds would not yet cool him, but he rested briefly in the shade of the trees. His legs were weary his eyes heavy. But he continued on, travelling to the sunstone. Again, the Allmaker spoke. The gentle warmth of the sun is stolen, so now it only burns. Free the sun from the halls of Penumbra. And so Avar walked west, over the frozen lands, until he reached the halls of Penumbra. The air inside was thick and heavy, and he could see no further than the end of his arm, Still, he felt his way along the walls, though he heard the shuffling of feet 
and knew that this place held the unholy beasts who would tear his flesh and eat his bones. For hours he crept along until he saw a faint glow at the end of the hall. There, from behind a sheet of perfect ice, came a glow so bright he had to shut his eyes lest they be forever blinded. He plucked the flaming eye from one of the unholy beasts and threw it at the ice with all his might. A small crack appeared in the ice, then grew larger. Slowly, the light crept out between the cracks, widening them, splitting the ice wall into pieces. With a deafening crack, the wall crumbled, and the light rushed over Avar and through the halls. He heard the shrieks of the unholy beasts as they were blinded and burned. He ran out of the hall following the light and collapsed on the ground outside. When he was able to rise again, the sun again warmed him and he was glad for that. He travelled back to the Sunstone, where the Allmaker spoke to him. The gift of the sun is the skulls once again. It will warm them and give them light. Avar had one final gift he had to recover, the gift of the winds. So he travelled to the Windstone, far on the western coast of the island. When he arrived, the Allmaker spoke to him, giving him his final task. Find the greedy man and release the wind from its captivity. So Avar wandered the land in search of the greedy man. He looked in the trees, but the greedy man did not hide there. Nor did he hide in the oceans or the deep caves, and the beasts had not seen him in the dark forests. Finally, Avar came to a crooked house, and he knew that here he would find the greedy man. Who are you? shouted the greedy man that you would come to my house. I am Avar of the Skarl, said Avar. I am not warrior, shaman, or elder. If I do not return, I will not be missed. But I have returned the oceans and the earth, the trees, the beasts, and the sun, and I will return the winds to my people, that we may feel the spirit of the Allmaker in our souls again. And with that, he grabbed up the greedy man's bag and tore it open. The winds rushed out with the gale force, sweeping the greedy man up and carrying him off, far away from the island. Avar breathed in the winds and was glad. He walked back to the windstone, where the Allmaker spoke to him a final time. You have done well, Avar. You, the least of the Skahal, have returned my gifts to them. The greedy man is gone for now, and you should not trouble your people again in your lifetime. Your Allmaker is pleased. Go now, and live according to your nature. And Avar started back to the Skarl village. And then what happened, Grandfather? What do you mean, child? He went home. No, when he returned to the village, the child continued, was he made a warrior? Or taught the ways of the shaman? Did he lead the Skarl in battle? I do not know. This is where the story ends, said the grandfather. But that's not the ending. That's not how stories end. The old man laughed and got up from his chair. Is it not? All right, cool. So I'm glad that you all just sat there for like 20 minutes while we read through the story of Avar the Stone Singer. And yeah, Avar, complete random nobody who was like, I got you, fam. I'll sort this village out, don't you worry. That is a true hero. Some guy who wasn't like, no, but I'm needed, I'm important, I must stay. Now he was like, I'll sort this out. I'll do this. Oh, thank you for the gifted subs. I could listen to you read a driver's manual. Don't tempt me, because I will do that at some point. That was like a really genuinely good story. And you know what the cool thing is? I bet that story will be relevant. I bet the stuff that we have read will matter. Can you read it again with your uniform on? And then Avar returned to the village, and the village elder said to him, Avar, where's your uniform? <laughs> Are you guys ready for some reading? Settle in. I'm about to tell you the true story. The plan to defeat Dagoth Ur. 
For the past 20 years, the Tribunal have tried unsuccessfully to execute this plan. However, we failed because we were required to stage an assault and simultaneously maintain the ghost fence to prevent the threat, threatened large-scale breakout of Dagoth Ur's blighted host. Thank you for all the subs. With the Nerevarine leading the assault and the Tribunal free to devote their full energies to maintaining the ghost fence, this plan has a greater chance of success. Unfortunately, the loss of the artifacts, Sunder and Keening, and the recent increase in Dagothur's strength pose new problems for the execution of the plan. Therefore, our proposed plan has the following five phases. 1. A series of aggressive raids to scout inside the ghost fence. 2. A series of aggressive raids to neutralize Dagoth Ur's ash vampire kin and recover artifacts from the bodies of his kin. 3. An assault on the Gate Citadel Veminal to neutralize Dagoth Venom and recover the artifact hammer Sunder. 4. An assault on Gate Citadel Odrasal to neutralize Dagoth Odros and recover the artifact blade Keening. And 5. An assault on Citadel Dagoth with the artifacts Wraithguard, Sunder, and Keening to sever Dagoth Ur's connection to the heart of Lorcan and thus destroy Dagoth Ur. Phase 1. Raids inside the Ghost Fence. The Tribunal, Ordinators, and Buoyant Armagers are familiar with the terrain and will provide maps and current intelligent reports. The region inside the Ghost Fence is dangerous and the Nerevarine will need to be familiar with its particular challenges. After measuring skills and resources against Dagothur's defences, the Nerevarine will know better how to pace a campaign, alternating raids with improving skills and getting better equipment and stockpiling resources. Phase 2. Raids upon Ash Vampire Citadels Dagoth Ur's kin have become remarkably more powerful in recent decades, after remaining stable for thousands of years. If they can be individually isolated and destroyed, they will not be able to support Dagoth Ur in latter stages of war. It may also be that the dramatic increase in their power comes from items enchanted by Dagoth Ur. Salvage of such items might contribute to resources. Phase 3. Assault on Gate Citadel Veminal. Essential to recover the artifact hammer Sunder for Phase 5. The Ash Vampire Dagoth Vemin. I say Vemin has possession of Sunder, and probably seeks to discover the secrets of its enchantments. He may also have access to notebooks and journals of Kagranak that have survived in the Dwemer workshops of Veminel. Phase 4. Assault on Gate Citadel Odrasol. Essential to recover the artifact blade Keening for Phase 5. The Ash Vampire Dagoth Odros has possession of Keening, and probably seeks to discover the secrets of its enchantments. He may also have access to notebooks and journals of Kagranak, that have survived in the Dwemer workshops of Odrasal. And Phase 5, Assault on Citadel Dagoth. All the previous stages are preparations for this stage. Recent expeditions show that Citadel Dagoth has undergone extensive expansion. The location will need to be carefully explored. The known route to the Heart Chamber will be well defended. Alternative routes may exist. Dagoth Ur will have anticipated our plan to destroy him by attacking the Heart, and he will almost certainly personally oppose approach to the Heart Chamber. Together, the Tribunal could not defeat him, and he has grown stronger since then. Admittedly, the Tribunal had the distraction of maintaining the Ghost Fence simultaneously with fighting Dagoth Ur, but even so, the challenge seems daunting. The adoption of this phased campaign seems to offer the best chance for success. In retrospect, the Tribunal's decision to directly assault Citadel Dagoth rather than proceed step by step through lesser objectives must be seen to have been a serious error. The Tribunal did not feel it had the option of a slow-paced or deliberate campaign, given that they had many other competing priorities, not the least of which was the maintaining of the Ghost Fence and outer defences surrounding Red Mountain. The Nerevarine, on the other hand, should be best served by a careful, step-by-step -step advance, with the additional advantage of building confidence along the way, while successes would undermine Dagoth Ur's own assurance in his defences. Employing Kagranak's tools. The source of Dagoth Ur's supernatural power is the heart of Lorcan. The heart 
is also the source of the tribunal's divine power. During mythic times, the gods took and hid Lorcan's heart beneath Red Mountain as a punishment for creating the mortal plane. The Dwemer discovered the heart while building underground colonies. High Craft Lord Kagranak created enchanted tools intended to tap the power of the heart. The War of the First Council was fought to prevent this sacrilege. Kagranak's use of these tools and the disappearance of the Dwemer race marked the end of the war. Kagranak's tools were recovered by Lord Nerevar and Dagoth Ur. Dagoth Ur was left to guard the tools while Nerevar came to consult with his advisors. In Nerevar's absence, Dagoth Ur experimented with the tools upon the heart and was corrupted. We returned to discover a deranged Dagoth Ur who refused to turn over the tools. When he attacked us, we drove him away. We left Red Mountain with the tools, and subsequently Sotha Sill discovered their secrets. Collectively, we all used the tools to establish a connection to the heart, enabling ourselves to transform our mortal natures. Thus, we became the Tribunal. Dagoth Ur had survived our attacks, and without the tools, in a manner not well understood, Dagoth Ur managed to establish a connection with the heart and transform himself into an immortal being. Our plan to destroy Dagoth Ur also runs the risk of destroying the Tribunal. The plan is to permanently disrupt Kagranak's enchantments upon the heart, severing connection with Dagoth Ur and ourselves, and rendering us all once again mortal. A mortal Kagranak may then be destroyed by mundane means. The loss of godhood and the possible death of the Tribunal are judged a necessary risk and sacrifice. The normal procedure for establishing connection with the heart is a three-step process. The wearer of Wraithguard strikes the heart with the Hammer of Sunder, causing the heart to produce a pure tone. Then the wearer of Wraithguard strikes the heart with the blade Keening, shattering the pure tone into a prism of tone shades. These tone shades are then imprinted upon the substance of the wearer of Wraithguard, giving him an immortal and divine nature. The Nerevarine will not be taught the secret rituals required to perform the third step. Instead, the Nerevarine will strike the heart with Keening for a second time, causing its tones to diverge into unstable patterns of interference. Further repeated strikes with Keening will further disrupt the tones, with the ultimate result of shattering and dispelling Kagranak's original enchantments binding the heart, thereby severing the heart's links with Dagoth Ur and with any surviving Heart Whites and with the Tribunal. Destroying Kagranak's enchantments on the heart will also stop the corruption effusion of the heart's divine power and end the blight on Morrowind. So, Hammer, step one. Keening, step two. Step three to become a god? They're not gonna tell you. You don't get to know that. The Nerevarine may be tempted to steal the power of the heart. Dagoth Ur and Sotha Sil alone know this secret. So the Sil's dead. Dagoth Ur may, in extremity, propose to teach the Nerevarine to use Kagranak's tools to become a god. We doubt that the Nerevarine is fool enough to trust Dagoth Ur and are content to take that risk. Be warned. The Nerevarine cannot safely equip either Keening or Sunder unless wearing Wraithguard. The Nerevarine will be injured every moment while holding either of these artifacts unless protected by Wraithguard. Persistence will be required, will be rewarded with death. If Nerevarine can equip an item while not wearing Wraithguard and receive no injury, the item is counterfeit. One last note. Dagoth Ur must not get hold of Wraithguard. The Nerevarine must be prepared and use a recall or armsivy intervention if there is any risk of death or capture. Dagoth Ur will not expect you to destroy Kagranak's enchantments on the heart. He does not know it's possible. He would not do it himself, and he knows we have never tried it. He will not believe anyone would want to sacrifice the promise of such power. 
Further, advancement in House Dagoth, as in all great houses, is by challenge and confrontation within the hierarchy. The Nerevarine's challenges and defeats of Ash Vampires and battles with the Sixth House will be viewed in that light. Dagoth Ur and his kin may assume the Nerevarine's ambition is to control the heart. Given that assumption, it's only reasonable that the Nerevarine would try to defeat each of Dagoth Ur's subordinates in turn, working up to Dagoth Ur. If the Nerevarine can defeat Dagoth Ur and control the heart, so much the better. But logically, the Nerevarine would wish rise as high as the hierarchy as possible before cutting a deal with the head of the house. Dagoth Ur should try to recruit the Nerevarine into House Dagoth. It may be possible to pretend to join him, then betray him. However, any attempt to deceive him will be very risky. House Dagoth has a tradition of subterfuge and treachery. Because he is a deceiver, he will expect deception. We place no compulsion upon the Nerevarine to adhere to the plan described here. We believe they offer the best chance of destroying Dagothur, but we have chosen to place our trust in the Nerevarine's judgment and skill. Frankly, we see no alternative. If there are doubts or questions, speak with Vivek. He has agreed to serve as the Nerevarine's guide and counsellor for this campaign. It may be that if the Nerevarine succeeds, the tribunal will not survive. Such sentiments as might have been expressed to the tribunal should, in that case, be addressed to the land and people of Morrowind. May the happy convergence of fortune and prayer meet in our destiny. On behalf of Lady Almalexia and Lord Sothasil, Vivek. So, they definitely did some bad stuff. To become the tribunal. Didn't you kill Almalexia? Potato, potato. You know. Did I kill her? She's dead. And I may have had a part in that. Let's read the Battle of Red Mountain. <coughs> the following is a transcript of the words of Lord Vivek, addressed to a dissident priest. Malua Omain, who confronted Vivek with the Ashlander traditions surrounding the Battle of Red Mountain and with prophecies of the Nerevarine, and to unnamed magistrates of the Inquisition who joined Vivek in interrogating the dissident priests. Who can clearly recall the events of the distant past? But you have asked me to tell you, in my own words, the events surrounding the Battle of Red Mountain, the birth of the Tribunal, and the prophecies of, N of a Nerevar reborn. Here is what I can tell you. When the Kaima first abandoned the herds and tents of their nomadic ancestors and built the first great houses, we loved the Daedra and worshipped them as gods. But our brethren, the Dwemer, scorned the Daedra and mocked our foolish rituals and preferred instead their gods of reason and logic. So the Kaima and the Dwemer were always at bitter war until the Nords came and invaded Resdane. Only then did the Kaimer and Dwemer put away their strife and join together to cast out the invaders. Once the Nords were driven out, General Nerevar of the Kaimer and General Dumak of the Dwemer, who had come to love and respect one another, resolved to make peace between their people. In that time, I was but a junior counsellor to the Nerevar and Nerevar's queen, Almalexia, and his other favourite counsellor, Sotha Sil, always doubted that such a peace might long survive, given the bitter disputes between Kaima and Dwemer. But by negotiation and compromise, Nerevar and Dumak somehow managed to preserve a fragile peace. But when Dagoth Ur, Lord of House Dagoth, and trusted as a friend by both Nerevar and the Dwemer, brought us proof that High Engineer Kagranak of the Dwemer had discovered the heart of Lorcan, and that he had learned how to tap its powers, and was building a new god, a mockery of Kaimer faith and a fearsome weapon, we all urge Nerevar to make war on the dwarves and destroy this threat to Kaimer beliefs and security. Nerevar was troubled. He went to Dumak and asked if what Dagoth Ur said was true. But Kagranak took great offence 
and asked whom Nerevar thought he was, that he might presume to judge the affairs of the Dwemer. Nerevar was further troubled and made pilgrimage to Holomayan, the sacred temple of Azura, and Azura confirmed that all that Dagoth Ur said was indeed true, and that the creation of a new god of Dwemer should be prevented at all costs. When Nerevar came back and told us what the goddess had said, we felt our judgment confirmed, and again counseled him to war, chiding Nerevar for his naive trust in friendship, and reminding Nerevar of his duty to protect the faith and security of the Kaima against the impiety and dangerous ambitions of the Dwemer. Then Nerevar went back to Vardenfell one last time, hoping that negotiations and compromise might once again preserve the peace. But this time, the friends Nerevar and Dumark quarrelled bitterly, and as a result, the Kaima and Dwemer went to war. The Dwemer were well defended by their fortress at Red Mountain, but Nerevar's cunning drew most of Dumak's armies out into the field and pinned them there, while Nerevar, Dagoth Ur, and a small group of our companions could make way into the heart chamber by secret means. There, Nerevar, the Kaima King, met Dumak, the Dwarf King, and they both collapsed from grievous wounds and draining magics. With Dumak fallen and threatened by Dagoth Ur and others, Kagranak turned his tools upon the heart, and Nerevar said he saw Kagranak and all his Dwemer companions at once disappear from the world. In that instance, Dwemer everywhere disappeared without a trace. But Kagranak's tools remained, and Dagoth Ur seized them, and he carried them to Nerevar, saying, that fool Kagranak has destroyed his own people with these things. We should destroy them, right away, lest they fall into the wrong hands. But Nerevar was resolved to confer with his queen and his generals, who had foreseen this war would come, and whose counsel he would not ignore again. I will ask the tribunal what we shall do with them, for they have had wisdom in the past that I had not. Stay here. Loyal Dagoth Ur, until I return. So Nerevar told Dagoth Ur to protect the tools and the heart chamber until he returned. Then Nerevar was carried to us where we waited on the slopes of Red Mountain, and he told us that all that had transpired under Red Mountain. What Nerevar has said that the Dwemer had used special tools to turn their people into immortals and that the heart of Lorcan had wondrous powers. Only later did we hear from others present that Dagoth Ur had thought the Dwemer destroyed, not made immortal, and no one knows for sure what really happened there. After hearing Nerevar, we gave our counsel as he requested, proposing we should preserve these tools in trust for the welfare of the Kaima people, and who knows, perhaps the Dwemer had not gone forever, merely transported to some distant realm from which they may someday return to threaten our security once again. Therefore, we need these tools to study them and their principles so we may be safe in future generations. And though Nerevar voiced his grave misgivings, he was willing to be ruled by our council under one condition, that we should all swear a solemn oath upon Azura, that the tools would never be used in the profane manner that the Dwemer had intended. We all readily agreed and swore solemn oaths at Nerevar's dictation. So then we went with Nerevar back into Red Mountain and met with Dagoth Ur. Dagoth Ur refused to deliver the tools to us, saying they were dangerous and we could not touch them. Dagoth Ur seemed to be irrational, insisting that only he could be trusted with the tools, and then we guessed that he had somehow been affected by his handling of the tools. But now I feel sure that he had privately learned the powers of the tools, and had in some confused way decided he must have them for himself. Then Nerevar and our guards resorted to force to secure the tools. Somehow Dagoth Ur and his retainers escaped, 
but we gained the tools and delivered them to Sotha Sil for study and safekeeping. For some years, we kept the oaths we swore to Azora with Nerevar. But during that time, in secret, Sotha Sil must have studied the tools and divined their mysteries, and at last he came to us with a vision of a new world of peace with justice and honour for nobles, and health and prosperity for the commoners, with the tribunal as immortal patrons and guides. And dedicating ourselves to this vision of a better world, we made a pilgrimage to Red Mountain and transformed ourselves with the power of Kagranak's tools. And no sooner than we had completed our rituals and begun to discover our new-found powers the Daedra Lord Azora appeared and cursed us for our forsworn oaths. By her power of prophecy, she assured us that her champion, Nerevar, true to his oath, would return to punish us for our perfidy, and to make sure such profane knowledge might never again be used to mock and defy the will of the gods. But Sotha Sil said to her, the old gods are cruel and arbitrary and distant from the hopes and fears of Myrrh. Your age is past. We are the new gods, born of the flesh and wise and caring of the needs of our people. Spare us your threats and chiding in constant spirit. We are bold and fresh and will not fear you. And then in that moment, all Kaima were changed into Dunma and our skins turned ashen and our eyes into fire. Of course, we only knew that at the time this had happened to us. But Azora said, This is not my act, but your act. You have chosen your fate and the fate of your people, and all Dunmer shall share your fate from now until the end of time. You think yourselves as gods, but you are blind and all is darkness. And Azora left us, in darkness, and we were all afraid, but we put on brave faces and went forth from Red Mountain to build the new world of our dreams. And the new world we shaped was glorious and generous, and the worship of the Dunmer fervent and grateful. The Dunmer were at first afraid of their new faces, but so the Sil spoke to them, saying that it was not a curse, but a blessing, a sign of their changed natures and sign of the special favour they might enjoy as new myrrh. No longer barbarians trembling before ghosts and spirits, but civilised myrrh, speaking directly to their immortal friends and patrons, the three faces of the tribunal. And we were all inspired by Sothasil's speech and vision, and took heart. And over time, we crafted the customs and institutions of a just and honourable society. And the lands of Resdane knew millennia of peace, equity, and prosperity unknown to other savage races. But beneath Red Mountain, Dagoth Ur had survived. And even as the light of our bold new world shined even more brightly, beneath Red Mountain, the darkness gathered. A darkness that was close kin to the bright light that so the sill coaxed from the heart of Lorcan with the tools of Kagranak. As the darkness grew, we fought it and crafted walls to confine it. But we never could destroy it, for the source of the darkness was the same source as the source of our own divine inspiration. And in these latter days of Morrowind, reduced to a subjugated province of the Western Empire, as the glory of the temple fades and the dark tide rises from Red Mountain, we are reminded of Azora and her promised champion's return. We have waited, blind and in darkness, mere shadows, drained of our ardent vision, in shame of our folly, in fear of our judgment, and in hope of our deliverance. We do not know if the outlander claiming to fulfil the prophecies of the Nerevarine is our old companion, Nerevar reborn, or a pawn of the Emperor, or a catspaw of Azora, or some simple twist of fate. But we will insist you adhere to the Temple Doctrine and conform to the strictures dividing the hierographer from the apographer, and that you not speak that which must not be spoken openly. Act as a dutiful priest should, in accordance with your vows uh, of obedience to the canons and arch-canons, and all will be forgiven. Defy me, 
and you will know what it is to stand against a god. Dagothur's plans. The following documents were prepared by temple scholars and agents of the Inquisition from Lord Vivek. From interrogations of captured sleepers and other six-house cultists, from study of manuscripts written by cultists and victims of dream-inducing mania, from interviews with Lord Vivek concerning historical campaigns against Red Mountain, and from broad conjectures and inferences made upon these materials, this is our best estimate of Dagoth Ur's motivations and objectives in this most recent phase of his war upon Morrowind. Basic objectives. 1. Establish a theocracy in Morrowind based on the worship of the newborn god, Akalukan, second Numidium, to be created by Dagoth Ur from the heart of Lorcan and a body constructed according to the principles and rituals pioneered by the Dwemer Kagranak. Establish the ancient heirs of House Dagoth as the god priests of Akalukan, and the sixth house of Dagoth Ur as the dominant political power in Morrowind. Through charismatic conversion, unite the Dunmer under the guidance of Dagoth Ur to battle against the foreign animals who hold Morrowind in subjection. Note, Dagoth Ur has apparently adopted the views and motivations of the Dwemer Highcraft Lord Kagranak. In effect, he replicates the ancient blasphemous folly of the Dwemer. Step 2. Expose the false worship of the tribunal and destroy the ecclesiast ecclesiastical authority and political power of the temple. How much the dissident priests or the cult of the Nerevarine may be controlled or influenced by the Sixth House in this regard is open to speculation. Step 3. Extirpate all remaining individuals of inferior and mongrel races from Morrowind. Step 4. Drive the Empire from Morrowind. Step 5. Recover ancient territories stolen by Skyrim and Argonia. Step 6. Extend the worship of the Akulokan to all nations of Tamriel through subversion and conquest. Plans to establish and expand the Sixth House. Phase 1. Secure Red Mountain against tribunal intruders. Deny tribunal access to the heart, weakening the temple while securing Red Mountain for the creation of Akulukan. Keep the construction of a second Numidium a secret. Phase 2. Create passive servants in ever-widening circles around Red Mountain by broadcasting compulsions couched in dream imagery to susceptible subjects in their sleep. Establish a major operational base at Kogarun for further operations in the Ash Wastes. Establish smaller bases near small port villages and in lower class waterfront districts in Vivek. Infiltrate and subvert smuggling syndicates. Recruit willing followers from disaffected populations, including the underworld, the poor, and rabid anti imperial activists. Phase 3. Expand the smaller bases to other towns and villages, and recruit and indoctrinate subjects made susceptible by dream sendings. Occupy abandoned towers and ruins, and train corrupted cultists as raiders and irregular troops. Identify, discredit, and decimate possible sources of political resistance. Phase 4. Use assassination and terror to weaken, distract, and disrupt the legions and the imperial bureaucracy, along with the Hlalu sympathizers. Inspire popular uprisings of the native poor against the foreign rich and powerful. Summon sleepers and dreamers to Dagoth Ur to work on the second Numidium. Inferring Dagoth Ur's perspectives. Dagoth Ur thinks on a large time scale for the most part in the outside of time scale of the divine consciousness. He thinks that only obstacles of mythic scale are worth consideration. He believes he is fated to rule Morrowind, to free Morrowind of the Empire, and become the new hard-loving father of Morrowind. Given that perspective, the only opposing force Dagoth Ur worries about are the Tribunal, the Daedra, the Emperor, and the Incarnate. With the Tribunal's loss of Sunder and Keening, and with the diminishing resources of Vivek, Almalexia, and Sothasil, Dagoth Ur believes he has permanently gained a decisive strategic advantage. On a mortal timescale, the battle may last for centuries, but the outcome is not in doubt, and a Kalokan may be a device for dramatically reducing the timescale for a decisive victory. 
The myth of dynamic invincibility of the emperor and the empire has long been unquantifiable and intimidating threat. But recent rumours of unrest in Cyrodiil, of the emperor's failing health and the unsettled question of the succession have diminished the scale of that threat. Nonetheless, the revelation that the Nerevarine is a pawn of imperial intelligence, hand-picked and sent to Morrowind by the Emperor himself, may cause Dagoth Ur considerable anxiety. The data represent no coherent obstacle to Dagoth Ur. Nonetheless, their personal abilities and their influence upon their fanatic followers is considerable. Their motives and actions obscure, and Dagoth remains concerned about them. The Incarnate represents St. Nerevar, a mythic force that has previously defeated Dagoth Ur, and Dagoth Ur is obsessed with this threat. At the same time, Dagoth Ur knew Nerevar personally, knew that he was a mortal man with faults and weaknesses. Dagoth Ur may have some hope of seducing or negotiating with Nerevar's reincarnation. Further, when Nerevar and the Tribunal defeated Dagoth Ur, they were strong and allied. Now, the Nerevarine and the Tribunal are weak, opposed, and divided. Therefore, the Nerevarine and the Tribunal represent the most serious threat to Dagoth Ur's plans. He still has good reason to believe this time he will prevail. A recent timescale of Dagoth Ur's activities, much of the following is based on inference from incomplete information. Before 2E882, Dagoth Ur and his kin lie dreaming beneath the sills of Red Mountain. During the year 882, Dagoth Ur and his ash vampires awake refreshed and emerge from Lower Red Mountain into the Heart Chamber. Dagoth Ur ritually binds himself and his brethren as Heart Whites in a ritual of his own devising. First stages of construction of a second Numidium, conceived during the Long Sleep, are begun by Heart Whites and Atronach constructs in a chamber near the heart of Lorcan, keeping the second Numidium project a secret from the Tribunal is a high priority. 882. The Tribunal arrive at Red Mountain for their annual ritual, bathing in the heart's power. Dagoth Ur and Ash Vampires ambush the Tribunal. The Tribunes are driven away and prevented from restoring themselves with Kagranak's tools at the heart of Lorcan. 882, 3 to year 417. Intermittent Tribunal campaigns assault Red Mountain. The Tribunal and supporting forces seek to force access to the heart chamber but are repeatedly driven back. Dagoth Ur recruits sleepers and dreamers through dream sendings. Cultists are recruited through dream compulsion. Weaker cultists become corporous beasts. Stronger cultists ascend through the stages toward the power of the ascended sleepers. In the year 400, Kogarun reoccupied by Dagoth Uthol and fortified as an advanced base for six house operations, blight storms more frequent and widespread. Soul sickness spreads into regions close to Red Mountain. Year 410. The Sixth House base founded near Narmok and in waterfront areas of Vivek. Sixth House operatives exploit smuggler organizations and communications to spread their influence amongst victims unbalanced by Dagoth Ur's dream sendings. Year 415. Small cells of Sixth House cultists in every town in Vardenfell. Larger Sixth House operations are concealed in remote dungeons where creatures are bred and cultists are trained for the coming struggle. Year 417. Almalexia and Sotha Sil lose the artifacts Keening and Sunder to Dagoth Ordos and Vemin. Vivek rescues Almalexia and Sotha Sil, but failing to recover Keening and Sunder. The Tribunal retreat from Red Mountain in disorder. Surviving buoyant Armager companions know the Tribunal was forced to retreat, but do not know how serious a reversal the Tribunal has suffered. The three Tribunes return to their respective capitals and continue to perform their ritual functions. The Tribunes continue to grow weaker without access to the heart and because of resources required to support the Ghost Fence. The inner circle of the Temple Priesthood has begun to suspect the Tribunes have suffered seriously from wounds and demoralization in the wake of reverses at Red Mountain, but do not recognize the scale of the problem. Year 426. Campaign of Sixth House assassinations of prominent Imperial citizens and Hlalu Imperial sympathizers. Sudden increase in number and seriousness of attacks by cultists and victims deranged by soul sickness.
Noted with concern, Dagoth Ur can apparently perceive and communicate directly through his cultists. Sleepers and dreamers are often reported speaking as though with Dagoth's voice and intention. Little is known about the features, scale, or stage of completion of the Akalukan Second Numidium. No one has gained entrance to the Heart Chamber since year 282 of the Second Age. In the Third Age 417, Keening and Sunder were captured and may substantially aid in Akalukan's construction. The following is from the Aprographa, the hidden writings of the Tribunal Temple. It is a scholarly retelling of a tradition transmitted through the Ashlander concerning the Battle of Red Mountain and subsequent events. The Ashlanders associate this tale with the telling of Alundro Sul, a shield companion of Nerevar who came to live among the Ashlanders, and the death of Nerevar and during the ascension of the Tribunal. There are many variant treatments of this story, but the primary elements are consistent throughout their tradition. The murder of Nerevar, the tragic fate of Dagoth Ur, and the profane source of the Tribunal's divine power are denied by Temple doctrine as ignorant Ashlander superstition and not widely known amongst civilised Dunmer. Resdane, present-day Morrowind, was contested ground between two very different types of Mur. The Kaima, who worshipped Daedra, and the Dwemer, who worshipped a profane secret power. These two people warred with each other constantly until their lands were invaded by a young, vibrant, and violent alien culture, the Nords. Two heroes, one from the Kaima and one from the Dwemer, Inderil Nerevar and Dumak Dwarf Orc, made peace between their people and together ousted the alien invaders. Then these two heroes worked long and hard to maintain that peace thereafter though their counsellors thought it could not last, or worse, that it shouldn't. Nerevar's queen and his generals, Almalexia, Sothasil, and Vivek, told him to claim all of Resdin for his own. But Nerevar would not listen, for he remembered his friendship with Dumark. There would be only peace until Dagoth Ur arrived. House Dagoth had discovered the source of the profane and secret power of the Dwemer, the legendary heart of Lorcan which Dumark's people had used to make themselves immortal and beyond the measure of gods. In fact, one of their high priests, Kagranak, was building a new god so the Dwemer could claim Resdane for their own. The tribunal urged Nerevar again to make war on the dwarves, but Nerevar was troubled. He went to Dumark, his friend of old, and asked if what Dagoth Ur has said was true. But Kagranak and the high priest of the Dwemer had kept their new god secret from the king, and Dumark said, the Dwemer were innocent of any wrongdoing. Nerevar was troubled again and made pilgrimage to Holomayan, the sacred temple of Azora, who confirmed that all Dagoth said was indeed true and that the new god of the Dwemer should be destroyed for the safety of not only Resdane, but the whole world. When Nerevar went back and told his tribunal what the goddess had said, his queen and generals felt themselves proved a right and again counseled him to war. There were reasons that the Dwemer and Kaima had hated each other forever. Finally, Nerevar, angered that his friend Dumark would lie to him, went back to Vardenfell. This time, the Kaima king was arrayed in arms and armour and had his hosts around him, and he spoke harshly to Dumak Dwarf Orc, king of Red Mountain. You must give up your worship of the heart of Lorcan, or I shall forget our friendship and the deeds that were accomplished in its name. And Dumark who still knew nothing of Kagnarak's new god, but proud and protective as ever of his people, said, We shall not relinquish that which has been ours for years beyond reckoning, just as the Kaima will not relinquish their ties to the lords and ladies of oblivion, and to come to my door in this way, arrayed in arms and armour with your hosts around you, tells me you have already forgotten our friendship. Stand down, my sweet Nerevar, or I shall swear by the fifteen and one golden tones I shall kill you and all of your people. And so the Kaima and Dwemer went to war. The Dwemer were well defended by their fortress at Red Mountain, but the bravery and cleverness of Nerevar's queen and generals drew most of Dumak's armies into the field and kept them there, so that Nerevar and Dagoth Ur could make their way into the heart chamber by secret means. There Nerevar met Dumak and the dwarf king, and they both fell from grievous wounds. Dagoth Ur slew Kagranak and took the tools that Dwemer used to tap the power of the heart, and went by his dying Lord Nerevar, 
and asked him what to do with these tools. And Nerevar summoned Azura again, and she showed them how to use the tools to separate the power of the heart from the Dwemer people. And on the fields, the tribunal and their armies watched as the Dwemer turned into dust all around them as their stolen immortality was taken away. Back in Red Mountain, Nerevar told Dagoth Ur to protect the tools and the heart chamber until they returned. Dagoth Ur said, But shouldn't we destroy these tools at once, so they might never be used for evil again? But Nerevar was confused by his wounds and his sorrow, for he still loved Dumark and the Dwemer people, and so went to the fields outside of Red Mountain to confer with his queen and his generals, who had foreseen that this war would come and whose counsel he would not ignore again. I will ask the tribunal what we shall do with them, for they have had wisdom in the past that I had not. Stay here, loyal Dagothar, until I return. Then Nerevar told his queen and generals all that had transpired under Red Mountain, and how the Dwemer had used special tools to turn their people into immortals, and of the wondrous power of the heart of Lorcan. The tribunal decided that the Kaima should learn how to use this power, so Nerevar might claim Resdane for the, and the world for their people. Nerevar did not expect or want this. So he asked his queen and generals to help him summon Azora again for her guidance. But the tribunal had become as greedy as Kagranak upon hearing of the power of the heart, and they coveted it. They made rituals as if to summon Azora as Nerevar wanted, but Almalexia used poisoned candles, and so the Sil used poisoned robes, and Vivek poisoned incantations. Nerevar was murdered. Then Azura came forth anyway, and cursed the tribunal for their foul deeds. She told them she would use her powers over dusk and dawn to make sure Nerevar would come back and make things right again. But the tribunal laughed at her, and said they would be gods themselves, and the Kaima people would forget the old ways and worship. And Azura knew this would be true and that it would take a long time before her power may bring Nerevar back. What you have done here today is foul beyond measure, and you will grow to regret it, for the lives of gods are not what mortals think, and matters that weigh only years to mortals weigh on gods forever. And so that they might know forever their wicked deeds, Azora changed the Kaima into Dunma, and their skin turned ashen and their eyes turned to fire. Let this mark remind you of your true selves who, like ghouls, feed on the nobility, heroism, and trust of their king. And then the tribunal went into Red Mountain and met with Dagoth Ur. Dagoth Ur saw what had been done, for his skin had changed as well, and he tried to avenge the death of Nerevar, but to no avail. He was driven off and thought dead. The tribunal found the tools he had been guarding and, through study of Kagranak's methods, turned themselves into gods. Thousands of years after their apotheosis, the tribunal are still the gods of Morrowind, and the old ways of worship are remembered only by a few, and the murder of Nerevar is known to fewer, but his queen and generals still fear his return, for the words of Azura linger long and they see the mark of her curse on their people every day. And that, boys and girls, is the story of Morrowind. Vivek, the false god who killed his friend. Almalexia, the crazed general who killed her friend. And Sothasil, the crazed tinkerer who killed his friend. All of them, driven insane by the power they so wanted. And now Vivek knows that if we recover, sunder the hammer and keening the blade and wield them, while we have the Wraith Guard equipped to not die, we could stage an assault on Citadel Dagoth, dive into the heart of Lorcan, strike it once with sunder and twice with keening, to shatter Dagoth Ur's connection, in turn also killing the Tribunal, but freeing Morrowind from
from the risk of eternal subjugation. There are no heroes in this story. What Vivek did is wrong, but what he's doing now is an attempt to make up for it. What Dagoth Ur originally did was right. Da I'm sorry, but Dagoth Ur was right. He literally stood by and watched as Nerevar was slaughtered by the three members of the tribunal. Yes, Dagoth Ur was corrupted by the powers of Kagranak's tools, but ultimately, I don't think what Dagoth Ur did at the start was wrong. However, now he is mad. He is insane now. He started off as a bro, but now, unfortunately, he has changed. <laughs>